Amen. All right. Well, I just want to welcome you all here. So glad you're here. I want to say hello to those of you that are watching online. Glad you're with us. I want to tell you if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, that you are to win your friends, win your family, and win your neighbors for Christ. And if you are new to this whole Christian thing, maybe you're just joining us and checking it out, or you're online and want to see what's this whole Christian thing about, I want you to know that God accepts you just as you are. And he sees the potential of who you can be. In other words, he's going to accept you how you are, but he ain't going to leave you that way. He's got a whole bunch of stuff he's going to do in your life that's just going to blow your mind. So we're glad you're with us. We hope you enjoy your time. But I want to tell you one more thing. This is the Word of God. And the Word of God changes the lives of the people who read it. And so today we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4. And the title of today's message is, A New Motivation in Life. So if you're just joining us right now, uh, I want to let you know about this series we're in, When Disciples Send. This is the track that we run our train on. Um, what we're doing with this is trying to really lay out the mission for our church. This is what we're about. We're about winning people over for Jesus Christ. We're about discipling them. In other words, getting them to grow in their newfound faith. And then we're about giving them opportunities to be sent out to go and win people for Christ. And that's the whole purpose of this series. And we've been going through a few things. We talked about already two methods of winning people for Jesus. Now, we're going to go through a total of six methods. Uh, like I said, we've already done two. Today, we're going to finish up the disciple portion of this series. And then when we get back together um, we're going to do another couple of methods of winning, but there's going to be a little break in between that. So I want to explain this. For the next two Sundays, I'm going to be in Israel. And so I'm really excited to let you know that while I'm gone, how many of you listen to K-Wave? Several of you. How many of you listen to Pastor's Perspective? Okay, so how many of you know James Cadiz? James Cadiz is going to be here next Sunday. So that's really cool. Um, you've heard his personality on the radio, then you're going to know it, it's actually even bigger personality when he's live and in person. I've had the, the blessing to, to listen to him speak live a couple of times, and he is an amazing communicator. He makes me feel really stupid when it comes to Bible knowledge because the guy has just got an amazing mind. So that's going to be next Sunday. And the Sunday after that, we're blessed to have Brad Ormonde, who's an administrative pastor for Harvest Riverside, and he's going to be out speaking here. So you guys are going to be blessed. Um, when I come back, you're going to be like, man, I wish he'd be gone for a while longer and get guys like this to come in. Um, but I really uh, hope that these are a couple of guys that you can invite your friends out, give them an opportunity, especially, you know, like with James Cadiz, he's just one of those guys that could just answer anything. He just knows the Bible so well. So it's going to be a great time. So invite your friends out or invite your family out for that. Um, I also want to let you know, uh, just kind of an update, we talked last week, for those of you who live in Menifee, uh, we talked about something that's going on in school districts, and so uh, this is going to affect more than just Menifee people, this is actually going to affect all of Southern California, so I just want to briefly tell you about this, there's more to come, we're going to be letting you know what's going on, um, but you need to know that the curriculum being taught in our school system in, in, in all of California is straight from Satan. You need to know that your children, your community is, is being infiltrated by the enemy. The, uh, the school district's going to lie to you. We've already seen it in our, in our meeting. We went out to the Menifee School District. They lied. We know they lied. And that is, that is straight from Satan. He is the father of all lies. And um, the, the curriculum that's being used... Um, it's weird. I mean, just the, the, even the terms that are in it. Uh, when I was a kid, if I even said the term, I would have been smacked in the mouth. I mean, it's that filthy, dirty, disgusting. And so um, we're going to be letting you know more about that, but it's going to be up to us. God has called us as believers. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are two things. You are salt and you are light. Salt preserves light reveals. And so we're going to give you an opportunity. Talk about being sent out. We're going to give you an opportunity to go out and be the salt and be the light that God's called you to be. And it's going to be up to us as believers to do what God's called us to do. Amen? Amen. So more, more to come on that. All right. Uh, we 
talked last time we were together, we talked about a new way of managing your relationships and the fact that God wants to use your relationship for his glory, to proclaim who he is. And um, to, you know, when we talked about proclaiming, that we're, we're talking about shining. So you got to let your light shine through your relationship. So we talked about your marriage. We talked about parenting. We talked about work, uh, these different relationships that we have in life. And so if you missed last week, you can go to 412myriata.com forward slash sermons and you can catch up. But today we are going to talk about what motivates you in life. And what I mean by that is what is it in life that, that causes you to do the things that you do? And I, as I was thinking about this, I always remember growing up and I had this attitude, and maybe you've had this attitude, where you go, I really don't care what people think about me. Have you ever had that come up in your thought process? How many of you will admit to it? You've, you've had that thought. I don't care what people think about me. All right, so we, most of you know that feeling and, and that, that thought of I don't care, but the fact is we really do. We really do care what other people think about us. Uh, think about in this terms, how many of you are on social media? Okay, lots of you are on social media. And, and for those of you who aren't, you see people on social media. And so you understand that, that we live in a generation where people really, truly care what other people think about them. That's why they're taking selfies and they're like, ooh you know, and they're just, they got that phone up and they're trying to get in front of the mirror, make sure their pose is right. And they're taking 57 photos and then they have to, you know, swipe through them and pick out the one that's just right. Then they got to get a filter and add that to it. So their skin looks all nice and perfect and it's just not real. And yet we post it out because that's what we want to portray. That's what we want people to think when they see us. And we pose for these things and we set up the pose because we want it to look so good. That's a motivation. It motivates us to do certain things in life. And we're seeing that become more and more prevalent. We buy certain homes because we want people to think a certain thing about us. We wear certain clothes because we want people to look at us a certain way. We drive certain cars because we want people to look at us a certain way. These desires that we have for approval, for acceptance, uh, to be liked by other people is a motivating factor in our life to do the things we do. So what I want to talk to you about today is... What are some other motivating factors that we can have in our life? Because when we, when we have the desire to be liked by other people, and that motivates us, really, what do we gain? We really don't gain much. But if you can find other factors in your life, other things to motivate you, you'll find that it can have lasting results uh, into eternity. So if you are a note taker this morning, I'm going to give you four new motivations in life. You ready? Three of you are ready. All right. Okay. So Colossians chapter four, we're going to pick right up in verse two where we left off last week. And there Paul says to the church, he says to continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, also praying for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Verse 5 says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that we, or sorry, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So going back when we first started the disciple portion, basically what we've done for disciples is just gone all the way through the book of Colossians. And when we opened up, we, the very first message was a new way of looking at the church. So as somebody's become a, a believer in Jesus Christ, and now they're growing up in their faith, their, their, their walk, if you will, uh, their walk with Jesus is now growing and maturing and becoming what God wants it to be. So we've talked about this idea that there has to be a new way, right? There's a new way of looking at the church, a new way of looking at Christ, a new foundation for life, all these different new things. And so we opened up with that new way of looking at the church. And we, we talked about the fact that it's a group of people that are loving others, they're bearing fruit, they're growing in their knowledge, they're exercising wisdom, and 
what we said is there are a group of people praying for one another. And Paul concludes this letter with the same concept. He says, pray. In fact, he says to pray earnestly. In other words, fervently, with sincerity. It's this thing that you continue on with. And then he says to pray vigilantly. Vigilantly, when he, when he says pray vigilantly, what he's saying is be aware of your surroundings. Be aware that there could be a calamity come upon you at any moment. And when you're aware of that, it causes you to be in constant communication with God. I can tell you this, and you all know this already, I am not perfect. It's not a shock to anyone, right? Except Sean. Sean, you're shocked. Awesome. <laughs> Um, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And I can tell you this. Hindsight's always 2020. As I look back, even in this last week, and the mistakes I've made just in this last week, I could tell you without a doubt that those mistakes I made, I made in the midst of a lack of communication with God. That, that I was not talking to God, I wasn't listening to God, there was nothing going on, no dialogue between me and God, and so I made the mistakes. And I can tell you that I've had some successes in this last week, and in the midst of those successes, there was communication with God. I was talking to Him, I was listening to what He had to say, and because that was going on, I found myself walking in the right direction and doing the right things, and... God bless me in those things. And so there's definitely this direct connect between our successes and our failures to our communication with God. Does that make sense? That is just definitely what he's trying to get across here. Pray vigilantly. Know that something bad could happen at any moment. It's going to cause you to talk to God. So in verse 7, we see that Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, uh, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening there. So Tychicus is this fellow worker of Paul. Uh, he's there in prison with Paul, and he's going to bring back a letter to the Ephesian church. And um, On Onesimus is this slave, and he was this guy that was, own he was owned uh, by this person in Colossae. And Paul's going to send this slave back as well. And he's saying, when you receive this slave back, receive him as a beloved brother. And this is just showing that, that as you come in contact with the Lord and you come into his family, there's definitely a change. There's a change in attitude. There's a change in how you treat others. And so he's saying, hey, look, he's one of us. Accept him in. He's a brother. And then in verse 10, Paul says that uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you uh, with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my fellow, or are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. And so we know from Acts chapter twenty that that Aristarchus is uh, this guy who would travel with Paul. He's kind of a travel companion of Paul, and we know that Justice is a guy we only know of here, and this is the only place that we we hear his name spoken of, but. I love that Paul is mentioning Mark, and he's mentioning uh, Mark being a cousin of Barnabas. Because in Acts chapter 13, there was a big falling apart. Paul and Barnabas were buddies. You may have heard me say, in your life, you're supposed to have a Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. Have you ever remember me talking about those different levels of people? Paul is somebody who's spiritually more mature than you. And so every believer should have a Paul in their life, somebody who's pouring into their life. And then every believer should have a Timothy, somebody who's less spiritually mature than you. So you're the Paul to them. And then you have your Barnabases. And the Barnabases are people just, they're kind of on the same level as you spiritually, and, you know, you're not confiding in them too much, you know, and you're not looking for them to pour into your life because you're both just on the same level. And that was Paul and Barnabas. They were these guys out doing ministry for God. They were accomplishing many things, and 
they had a disagreement. And they, they just didn't see eye to eye. And the Bible says unless two agree, they can't walk together. And so here they found themselves at odds and they just couldn't, couldn't walk together anymore. And so Paul had to continue doing what God had called Paul to do. And so what did Barnabas do? He had to go away. And he had to go do his own thing somewhere else. And that was something that happened. It wasn't good, but God accomplished much in it. But what I love to hear in this is time has gone by, and no matter what their differences were, Paul is saying, look, Mark, Barnabas, you know, these are two guys that, that are loved in the family of God. Welcome him back. You know, treat him nice. And that just shows the heart of Paul that, that even though they, they had a frustration, Paul was willing to show that he still loved that person. And that's a beautiful thing, and that's the way it should be within the body of Christ. So beautiful there as he closes this letter. Now take a look at verse 12. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. So again, here we see Paul just reaffirming this principle of prayer, how important prayer is. And he says that this guy Epaphras labored in prayer. How many of you know that prayer is not easy? It's hard to pray. Uh, sometimes we don't know how to pray. And sometimes it feels like it's a labor to pray. It's hard work. And it truly is. And I, I know this in my own life. Praying is not easy. And there's some people that's like, they're all about it. That's their, their ministry. You know, they just have a heart to pray and they're really, really good at it. And then you've got people like me. It's like, I want to pray, but sometimes my mind just goes over here, and it's like a struggle to bring it back to where it's supposed to be and focus on what I'm supposed to be focusing on. I can tell by a smirk on your face, you know what that's like, so I'm not alone, and that makes me feel good in this. It's difficult to pray. It's a labor. It's a work, and it requires that attitude of saying, it's work. It's something that I'm going to strive towards doing. I'm going to work hard at it. I'm going to put this, the time aside, and I'm going to actually be diligent to do it. And as difficult as it may be, I'm going to be silent for a while and just let God speak to me and listen. What is God saying? And this man here, Epaphras, he labored in prayer for these people. And I love what his prayer was. The Bible says that he prayed this. He said, pray that, that, um, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I'll tell you this. I hope you're all praying for that for me. That's, that's an awesome prayer. If you guys could be praying for your pastor to be doing that, that's awesome. I would love that because I'll tell you, it's not easy to do that. It's not easy to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. It's my prayer as I pray to God, like, Lord, let whatever your will is for my life, whatever you want me to be doing, let me find myself in the midst of that. Let me actually be doing those things. But but it's not always the case. It's hard. It's a struggle in life. But having people pray for you, knowing that, that God wants to accomplish much in your life, and knowing that when God wants to accomplish much, the enemy comes after that much, I'll tell you, um, just getting out to the Menifee School District and, and going out and sharing our, our belief as believers and using our voice, because I'll tell you, the left is really good. I say the left, I'm talking about the progressive left that wants to see God done away with in our community. They're really good at using their voice. We as Christians, not so much. We're not good at it. We're not organized. I hate to say it, but you know, we have to admit the truth. We're not good at it. We, we should get better. Um, but as we strive to do that, the enemy is going to come against us. And I felt that this week. The enemy coming against what God wanted to do in us and through us. And people are shaking their heads. They're like, I know what you're talking about. So some of you are like, okay, God's on the move. And I'm moving with him. And that means Satan's on the move. And he's moving against us. And it's not, it's not easy. And so it requires prayer. We need to pray uh, against, against the spiritual attacks. We need to pray for strength through the spiritual attacks. It's not going to be easy. So pray. Pray that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. 
Take a look at verse 14. It tells us there that Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Verse 15, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church that is in the house. So here we see Luke, the physician. We know he's the guy who wrote the gospel of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. And then there's two other guys, Demas and Nymphos. Um, these are guys we really don't know much about, but I, I want you to pay attention that it says that about this person, Nymphos, that there was a church in his house. So we, we know that, that the early church understood what the church was all about. The ecclesia, this group of people that made up the church. Uh, here in 2018, you know, just because of the, the culture we live in and what's been developed, a lot of people think that the church is this building. So they think, okay, well, I'm going to church. And their mind is, I'm going to this building that is the church. Well, the building is not the church. You are the church. We are the church. When Jesus was praying to his father, he says, Lord, let them be one as you and I are one. Well, Jesus is one with God because he is God. He is the second person in the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, right? It's three persons in one being, right? So they're one. And Jesus was saying, let them, let them be one. Now, do you think that God didn't answer the prayer of Jesus? Of course not. Of course he answered the prayer of Jesus. So we are one. And yet we just kind of fail to realize it. We're like, oh, I don't know, just feel so disconnected. We're, we're more connected than we realize. We are one body in Christ. And we are the ecclesia. Really, when, it, when, uh, when the church started, there wasn't any church buildings until about the third century, way after Jesus died. Um, just like as long as our nation's been alive, it took that long for there to actually be a church building. So it was a long time. So he's talking about this church meeting in the home, which was just how it, how it happened. So remember, uh, that a church group is a group of people growing in knowledge or exercising wisdom. So in verse 16, Paul says that when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So, so don't just stop at Colossae. Don't just go to the Colossian church and, and read it there, but, but bring it over to Laodicea. If you read the book of Revelation, if you were here with us, we went through the seven churches of Revelation. You know that Laodicea was one of the churches. It was the lukewarm church. It was the one that wasn't hot. It wasn't cold. And God said, if you're not hot, if you're not cold, if you're, if you're lukewarm, I'm just going to spit you out. It was this church that was trying to ride the fence. Now, that's important for us to know. He's saying, hey, bring it to that church also that's trying to ride the fence, that they're not all for me. And God's saying, look, be all for me. And so read this. And we just went through it. So hopefully it's an encouragement to us to not ride the fence, but to be all in for God. And that's how we grow in wisdom. That's how we grow in knowledge is hearing more of God's word, reading these, these epistles to people so that way they know what God said. Also remember that a church is a group of people bearing fruit. That's why Paul says, uh, this instruction in verse 17. He says to um, Archippus, he says, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. This situation, I'm sorry, this salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. And so here is just this encouragement. Do the ministry God's called you to. Actually go out. Whatever God's called you to, go and do it. And some of you are saying, well, I don't know what the ministry is God has called me to. Well, we're going to talk about that when we get into the send portion. But just know this, that God has equipped each and every one of you for something very special. And God wants you to go out and use that gifting and actually accomplish much for him. And so the encouragement that Paul's giving here is the same encouragement to us. Finish the ministry. Actually go out and accomplish what God's called you to accomplish. Now, I told you I'm going to give you four new motivations today, and so I want to do that. If you would, go back to verse 3. We're going to go through verses 3 through 6 here and take a look at these new motivations because having a good Facebook page, having a good Instagram account, um, having the right clothes, 
that's not really going to get us very far in eternity. But if we want to accomplish much for God, we got to allow other things to motivate our lives. And so four new motivations. Uh, the first one is open doors to share your faith. So take a look at verse 3. Remember that Paul told the church to be praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So praying for an open door. If that's in your, your thought process that I want an open door, I want to be able to share my faith. If that is something that will motivate you, you will find that every interaction you have can become about that. I mean, this last week, I was at Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente, and um, there for a, a doctor's appointment, right? And so I'm standing in line afterwards to, to get a uh, prescription filled. And it's this long line to turn in your prescription. So I'm standing there in line and I allowed this concept, this, this hope for an open door, I allowed that to motivate me. So as I'm standing there, there's a guy behind me, and I'm thinking, okay, Lord, will you open a door here for me to talk to him? And behind him was this Muslim lady. She had the hijab on, and so she, clearly she was Muslim. So I'm thinking, all right, two for one here, you know, <laughs> because if I can talk to him, if God will open the door for him, then she's right there, and I'll speak loud enough that she can hear what I'm saying, and so she's going to hear the Word of God too, and so I'm just praying like, Lord, would you open the door, and you know what? That guy standing behind me, his name was Roy, and he actually started talking about the world and, and, and all this different, um, these different sicknesses that are going on. Well, we know from the book of Revelation, and we know from Matthew chapter 24, we know that there's, in towards, we, we get towards those end times in the day of the Lord, we know that there's going to be these sicknesses around the world. And so because he started talking about that, we were able to kind of just start kind of edging towards that topic. And over the course of about a minute or two, I said, well, you've read the book of Revelation? He's like, ah, uh, yeah. And I said, so do you know? And we started, you know, it started to develop even more. And next thing you know, we're full on talking about the Lord. And at, at the end of that talk, he's like, you know, I need to get back to church. And so then he started talking to me about this church. And so he said he's coming today. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we see him. But I know that the woman behind him heard about Jesus too because we weren't shy in talking about it and this guy just needed that boost and that encouragement to get to church. So it was a wonderful thing, but it motivated me. And if you'll allow that to motivate you, every interaction you have can be about that. See, we allow our, our Instagram pages, we allow our Facebook pages to motivate us and so when we're out and about, we're thinking, okay, where am I going to capture a photo How's that photo going to look? What am I going to write when I, when I post it? How am I going to make sure I get a lot of likes on that? And we allow, as we go through life, we allow that to motivate everything we do if we're on social media. Well, if we can say, hey, listen, for that open door, I'm going to allow that. I'm going to allow that to motivate everything I do. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the social media is bad. It's a wonderful tool if it's used properly. I'm not saying it's bad, but what I'm saying is it can't be the motivating factor of our life. The open door to share our faith has to be a motivating factor for us. It has to drive us. It has to drive our conversations. We're going to find that out. That's going to drive our conversations. It's going to drive our actions. It has to be something that motivates us. So will you allow that to motivate your life? That hope to share your faith with other people. The second thing is the fact that people are watching you. Now, I don't know about you, but that's definitely a motivating factor for me. Um, as I go through life, I mean, clearly, as a pastor, it has to be a motivating factor for me. Lots of people know I'm a pastor, um, and so if I'm out in town and I'm, I'm with my family, I know this. People, some people know me that I don't know. They just know that I'm a pastor, and so it, the fact that people may be watching me motivates me to go, okay, I better act appropriately, right? I mean, that's just, that's just, kind of how it goes. And on, on some level, that's for you as well. Maybe you're at work and somebody knows that you are a Christian. Well, if they know you're a Christian, they're watching you. 
Whether they say they're watching you or not, they're watching you. They're, they're watching how you act. They're watching how you treat others. They're watching uh, how you work, seeing if you cut corners. They're watching your every move, whether they'll admit it or not. People are watching you. And that should be a motivating factor for you to go, okay, if people are watching me, they know I'm a believer and they're watching me, I better live properly. I better, I better do something that's going to show glory to God. So take a look at verse 5. It says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. And so those who are outside, outside what? Outside the body of Christ. Those people who are not part of the church. So we're supposed to walk in wisdom towards them. In other words, no, not, not just knowing what's right, because that's not wisdom, that's knowledge. Wisdom is knowing what's right and doing it. And so God says, look, as you're walking around people that are on the outside, don't just know what my word says to do or not to do. Actually do what my word says to do and don't do what my word says not to do. That's wisdom. So walk like that. When, when the Bible says walk, it just means live out your Christian life. Live out your Christianity. Go about life bringing glory and honor to God. So as we walk this Christian life, we do it in a way that, that's wise. And we do it in a way where we're redeeming the time. What that means is just making the most of each opportunity, knowing that time is short. I mean, as, as far as this life on earth is concerned, the Bible says it's but a vapor. You know, it's just here one second and gone the next. That's our life. And the longer I live, the longer I realize, or the more I realize that's true. You know, having been married 22 years, I don't know where that time has gone. I really don't. I mean, I've been with my wife longer than I haven't been with her. And we've raised kids, and they're both adults now. And I don't know how that happened. I mean, just like a vapor, it just happens. And those of you who are beyond my age, you know it even more. That, that this life, it just goes by so fast. So we, we need to redeem the time. We need to take a look at every opportunity and make the most of it. Now, every opportunity is going to be different. Paul, he, he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So what is Paul talking about here? He's not talking about changing his doctrine. He's not talking about changing the message of God in order to appeal to different people. I'll tell you, that is a mistake that many Christians make. God's real clear in his word what the rules are. He's really clear what, what is obedient to him and what is disobedient to him. And several Christians go, well, I'm going to be all things to all people. And so if I need to go to the bar and I need to get drunk with that person, so that way we can you know, have something in common and they'll listen to me, you've ruined it. It's just wrecked. Because God says not to be drunk, but to be what? Filled with the Spirit. We're not to be drunk, we're to be filled with the Spirit. So when we go out and we get drunk because, hey, well, I'm going to connect with these people and now they're going to listen to me because you know, I'm on the same level as them and then we're good, we've wrecked it. Paul's not saying go and change the message go and change the theology. He's saying, look, maintain the truth and yet live in a way where you can connect with all people. And I love kind of how the New Living Translation translates this verse. It says, yes, instead of saying I've become all things to all men, what, what he says is, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. So so that's kind of the idea be, behind being all things to all men or all things to all people. The idea isn't that you would just compromise the word of God, but that you would look into the life of someone else and go, what do I have in common with them? And I can tell you, doesn't matter where a person lives, how much money they make, what color their skin is, whether they're married, whatever their social or I mean, their sexual preferences are, I don't care what it is, there's always going to be something that you have in common with that person. The challenge is find it. Find out how, how you can connect with that person. And for some people, it's going to be easier you know, when I first started in ministry, you know what my first ministry was? The very first ministry I ever did? Prison ministry. 
I loved it. I loved going into the jail. You know, you don't see it from here, but I got tattoos and stuff. And um, I loved, I loved going into the jail. I had my tattoos and, and uh, go in there. And I just like connected with guys in jail. It was like so easy for me to connect with them. And they listened to me. And it was just easy for them to listen to me. And um, I don't know. Maybe I was just like a thug when I was younger. I don't know. But uh, it was just real easy for me to talk with them. And they connected real well. And there's other people that's like, well, you know, don't go into the jail because they're not going to listen to you, you know. But for some reason, they just listened to me. And I love it. I did it for eight years. Loved it. And it's weird because now I'm a chaplain for the sheriff's department and I connect with the, with the cops. And I love that. So it's two different things. But, but you find, okay, where am I, I going to connect with the people? And you've got to find that way. There's a way that you can connect with everyone on this planet. Some things are going to be easier for you, but, but find a common ground and share with them what Jesus is like. Jesus was a pro. He was so good at this. He could walk into any community and just show them love. It didn't matter if they were sinful or not, because first of all, they were all sinful compared to Jesus, you know, but... But he could walk into any crowd, and people were changed. They, they came in contact with him, and they just loved him. Because here's the fact. People that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. That was just the case. People that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. That should mean if Jesus' spirit is within you, people that are nothing like Jesus should like you too. That's just the case. When we come into a room, I mean, we're going to talk about speech in a moment, but when we come into a room, people should like to be around us. You know, but that's not how the world sees Christians. It's just not. Uh, think, about, um, think about Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi said this. He said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Of course, we're so unlike Christ, but the more we do life, the closer we draw to Christ, the more we're transformed in our mind, the more we should become like Christ. It's just something that that happens over time. You are who you associate with. That's what my parents told me as I was growing up. That's because it's what it says in the Bible, bad company corrupts good character. You are who you hang out with. You become like them. And so if you'll hang out with Jesus, if you'll spend time talking to him, spend time listening to him, spend time doing the things that he likes to do, you're going to become more and more like him. And, and that's just the fact that, that people that were nothing like him liked him. So people that are nothing like him are going to like you too. It's a motivating factor, the, this idea that, that people are watching you. Um, I'll give you an example. So when, when I go out, to a restaurant. You all pray before meals, right? It's a pretty common thing. Uh, if I'm just all alone or I'm with my family, you know, we, I could pray. I could just have my food in front of me. I could have my eyes open and my mouth closed and just within my, my heart, I could pray and say, Lord, thank you for this food. This is awesome. I'm so grateful for it. Or I could choose to bow my head, close my eyes and just Thank God, Lord, thank you for this food. This is this outward expression of my, my heart, my gratitude towards you. And I know people are looking at me right now, but I'm going to exercise this part of my faith openly in front of people, knowing that people are watching me, because it's going to set an example of a bowed heart. And, and, that, and I do that. And my family does that. We will bow our heads in public knowing that people are watching us, and it's a motivating factor for me, because like I said, I could do, and I'm not doing it to show off, I'm doing it to just show a heart of appreciation to God, and my family does that as a, as a heart of appreciation to God, and we're doing that deliberately, so that way people would see what it's like to have that heart. So, so let your, the idea that people are watching you as Christians, let it motivate you to do things for God. You know, maybe you're at work and you're going to have your lunch. Bow your head right in front of your coworkers. I'm going to pray. And they know, they're watching you and pray. You know, there's this, uh, 
there's this farmer, I'll tell you a quick joke, there's this farmer, and he goes into to town to get some supplies, and he shows up at this little diner, and he's going to get some food, and, and he goes to, to eat his food, he bows his head, he closes his eyes, he's praying, and, and when he's done, he, he looks up, and there's these youngsters there in the, in the diner, and they're like, hey, old timer, does everybody pray where, where, before they eat their food, where you come from? And he goes, everybody but the pigs. Listen, when we pray, some of you are getting it. Some of you are like, what's he talking about? That's a bad joke. I get it. But here's the deal. <laughs> Listen, when we pray openly in front of people, it sends a message that we truly care about God. and We take our faith seriously. The fact that people are watching you should motivate you. Uh, the third thing is the fact that people are listening to you. It should motivate you. And so what you say and how you say it matters. Verse 6 says, let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt. Um, I've heard this said a lot as I was growing up. It doesn't matter what you say, it matters how you say it. You've heard that, I'm sure. It doesn't matter what you say, it's how you say it. Um, now, I'm a dog person. Any other dog people in the house? I love dogs. Um, I love, my, my dogs are cute. And I, we got three, but one of them's mine. And she's just the cutest little dog. And I know it's kind of weird because I'm a big guy. And she's just this little tiny, people would say, oh my gosh, it's just like an old man's dog. But she's so cute. Uh, she's a little multi poo, you know, and she just loves me and she loves being with me. And I could talk to her and say things a certain way to her where she just loves me, and I could just be telling her how rotten she is. You're just such an ugly dog. Oh, you're an ugly dog, aren't you? Oh, I hate you so much. You pooped on the floor, and I just want to smack you. But, and then as I'm like telling the dog this bad stuff, but in this high-pitched, loving voice, she's just wagging her tail, and she's like, he's great. Look at my owner. Oh, oh. And, and I'm telling her the worst things. You're a terrible dog. I want to go take you to the pound right now. And she's shaking her tail like I'm telling her something great. The thing is, that doesn't work with people. I've been married 22 years. I can't tell my wife, oh, I, I just can't stand you. Oh, you, yeah, you're just so ugly. <laughs> it matters what you say. I mean, it matters how you say it too, but it matters what you say. You got to say things that are uplifting. You got to speak in a way because people, not only are they watching you, but they're listening to you. They want to hear what you have to say. Even, even if they won't admit it. May, and even if their, their intentions are bad, maybe they just want to catch you in a lie. They want to trip you up. They want to they hold you accountable to something. So they're listening to see what they can get on you. They're listening to you. They know you're a Christian. They're listening to you. What we say and how we say it is so important. It needs to be speech that's always with grace, seasoned with salt. When it says seasoned with salt, I mean, it's got to be it's got to be tasteful talk. We've already talked about that earlier in the chapters, that we need to do away with the, the filthy language, do away with the anger and, and all these, these things that come out of our mouth. You know, the Bible says that whatever's stored up in your heart is going to come out with how you talk. People are listening to us. All right, so fourth thing, fourth and final thing, the need to have the right answer. Verse 6 concludes by saying that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So not only are there these open doors of opportunity, not only are people watching you and listening to you, but then people are going to expect that you have an answer. They're going to expect that you have some sort of solution to the issues they have in life solutions to the problems in their marriage, the problems in their finances, the problems with their children. They're going to expect that if you have this great faith in God and this great relationship with God, that you've got the answer to what they're going through. They're going to expect that. And that's not just for the, the pastor. You know, I, I, know I, I know that there's an expectation that people should be able to come to me and I have an answer. I mean, that's kind of a given. It's what I do for a living, but it's not just for the pastor. When you're at work, I'm not with you, and they're not going to come and talk to me anyways. Let's face it. They don't want to come and talk to some preacher. They've had enough of church. Church is weird. Those people are weird. I'm not going there. We already talked about how the world looks at the church. They definitely look at the church different than what it actually is, so they're not going to come here and talk to me. 
But if you've got that open door of opportunity and they've been watching you, they've been listening to you, and they come and ask you, you've got to be ready to give them an answer. That's a lot of pressure. Not only do you have to, I mean, you don't just have to know how to, to give them the answer, but you at least have to know how to point them in the right direction on how to get the answer. And it can't just go talk to the pastor. You've got to be able to show them how to search in the Bible and find these things because there's an answer in the Bible to everything we go through in life. And so it's a motivating factor for us to be a good listener. We've got to listen. What are they saying? What, are, what, what tone are they using when they're asking these questions, when they're sharing their life? What are, what are the things that, you know, not only are we good listeners, but it motivates us to be a good thinker and a good prayer. You know, when I'm, when I'm doing biblical counseling, people come in, I'm, I'm trying in that moment to be a good listener, a good thinker, and a good prayer. Okay, what are they telling me right now? How did they come to that conclusion? Why do they think the way they're thinking? What outside influences influence them to, to have that thought process? What, what is going to bring them to a different thought process? All these things are going through my mind as I'm counseling. And then prayer, like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to hear in this situation? I've had times where I'm counseling people, and they're telling me one thing, and I end up calling them out on something else. You know, they're, they're talking, uh, you know, I've had the Lord speak to me where, uh, you know, where a man was cheating on his wife, and they weren't even talking about that in the counseling session. And the counseling session is going on for a while, and I said, stop for a minute, because the Holy Spirit had spoken to me. I said, stop for a minute. Why are you cheating on your wife? And he's like, what, what are you talking about? I just want to know, why are you cheating on your wife? How did you know that? Did she, you know, and he, he was like trying to figure this out. Nobody had told me. His wife hadn't told me. His wife didn't even know. The Holy Spirit had spoken to me, and in that moment, he broke down and he admitted it. But the Holy Spirit, that's what I'm saying, like, it should motivate you that as you're having these conversations, pray. Lord, what do you want to do in this moment? What do you want to speak into these people's lives? You've got to be ready to give people an answer. It should motivate you to study the Bible ahead of time, to, to know some of the answers. It should motivate you to be a good Bible verse memorizer. You know, start to memorize these verses Hide them in your heart and be ready to bring them up. Like I said, whatever's stored up in your heart is going to come out in your language. And so, store it up. This is a huge motivation to be ready to give the answers to these people because they need the answers, just like you need the answers. They're not going to come to me. They're going to come to you because you're who they know. You're who they trust. So listen, as we close this morning and prepare for communion, let me tell you that, that these things, if these are going to be a motivating factor in your life, what this means is you've got to have Jesus on your mind. It, it means that when you wake up in the morning, you need to have that prayer of anticipation. Lord, what are you going to do today in my life? How are you going to use me? And as you go through life, it means a, a focus on that. Where's the open door? What's the conversation going to be? Who's it going to be with? Who are you going to open that door to? And Lord, how are you going to give me the right, right, right things to say? And am I going to be behaving right in that moment? I can tell you this. There's times where I was not behaving right. And it was just bad because they knew I was a Christian and I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. We need to make sure that, that this motivates us to constantly be doing the things God wants us to do. And I'll tell you, we live in a day and age that... that the darkness is getting so dark. I, I'm not trying to be a doom and gloom guy, but, but I want this to be an encouragement to you that, that the darker the darkness gets, the brighter your light shines. If we were to shut all the lights off in this room and it was pitch black and you just lit one little match, that would light up this room. Just one little flame would light it up because of all the darkness. So you may be thinking, okay, well, it's just one, one life. It's just me. What am I going to do? Well, the darker this world gets, <laughs> the more you can accomplish for God. We're living in a day and age where, where the darkness is growing darker. We need to be motivated to shine our light. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Well, hey, I hope that message you just heard was a blessing to you. It was a challenge to you. It was encouragement to you. Most of all, I hope that if you are a person who has not given your life to Jesus, 
that this message just encourages you to do just that. It's very simple to do. All you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can say this prayer with me right now. Father in heaven, I confess to you today that I am a sinner. Uh, Lord, that I have messed up in life. I haven't lived up to your very high standard, nor can I. And so I'm grateful for what I understand today. I understand that you sent your son Jesus to walk here on this earth, to live a life of perfection, to die a death on a cross, to go into the grave, but not just to stay there. He came out, he rose again, and I believe that today. I believe he sent his Holy Spirit. Lord, that as I believe in you today, your Holy Spirit will come upon me, that you will take up residence within me, that you will give me the strength, you will give me the wisdom, you will give me the courage, you will give me the boldness, the faith, everything I need to live for you. And so I promise this day forward that my life will be a life spent trying to please you. I pray, Lord, that as I mess up, and I know I will, I pray that your grace and your mercy would be upon me and that you would give me the encouragement to move forward. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, if you just said that prayer, first of all, I want to welcome you to the family of God. I want you to know that angels in heaven are rejoicing, and we here at 412 Marietta want to rejoice with you. And the next thing you got to know is there's a step that goes beyond giving your life over to Jesus, that is the step called discipleship. And what this is, is the process that you begin to grow in this newfound faith of yours. And we don't want to leave you alone to do that by yourself. God has given his Holy Spirit to you to help you in that, and he brings other people around you. And so we here at 412 Marietta want to help you in that process. So come on out to the church. We'd love to give you the encouragement, give you the tools that you need in this newfound faith. And uh, we'd love to help you grow in your walk. And so come on out on Sundays, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And if you do, come on out and say hello to me. I'd love to get to meet you and encourage you in your faith. God bless you. I love you.